Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> here we are, episode uh, five of Flamingo Sundays. Um, so what I thought was we've started off really, really strong with four absolute cracking guests. And I thought, let's get someone that isn't so great on. So, <laughs> so, so, so I got one of my really good friends, superstar lawyer, Ted Talker, probably the number one moustache in all of the eastern suburbs. Thank you, my friend. John Calanda. Oh, and also he's uh, a business owner and the founder of Executive Legal. John Calanda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Uh, it's, welcome. I, I love being insulted first thing in the morning. It's a very powerful motivator to get my life in order. How are you, buddy? Mate, thank thank you, you for having me. Thank you for coming in. I thought it was only fitting I was on the... Uh, the Cucks with Kalanta podcast. Right? You you were on Concepts with Kalanta, which is arguably Sydney's best podcast. I yes. mean, it exists at the same time as Flamingo Sunday, so I still assert that it is better than yours. But you did an amazing job. It was one of the most well-received episodes of my show, so thank you for coming on. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Mate, um, look, you're a bit of a superstar. You're an absolute lad of a bloke, and you just happen to be one of the best lawyers in all, all of town. You're very kind. You're very kind. Um, I, ha- I am a lawyer. I can definitely say that. Um, and I try to be a bit of a lad. I try to you know, enjoy what I do and li- you know, live up and enjoy life. Um, but yes, that's exactly right. I, I practice law. Uh, when, and you do it very well, I think, because the majority of lawyers, generally speaking, don't have a lot of personality. <laughs> you know, they're very, obviously with their job and what you guys do, it's pretty like, you know, straight down the line. It's pretty intense. You're dealing with a lot of shit every single day. And I don't think that must take a lot of their uh, energy and, and emotion out of their body. Yeah, look, I, I don't want to look. I don't want to denigrate my cohort because I'm not well, it's, it sounded a bit denigrating, but no. I just don't want you to get sued, man. No, um, the reality is that life as a lawyer is absolutely not like it is on television. You know, it's not glamorous. It's not Harvey Specter, you know, signing a contract and then jetting off to, you know, Milan. It's a lot of tedious, difficult, emotionally and spiritually draining work. Um, and I think that that really does take it out on people. Uh, I try really hard to, re- you know, recharge, spend time with people such as yourself, keep the energy going and keep keeping it up. And then sometimes it's not that easy. Your mental health really does take a battering in my line of work. Right. And, you know, like we, we come in contact a couple of years ago, didn't really know what you did. We met on a boat and now here we are. So I think, look, you've had a pretty cool, you've had, <laughs> you've had a pretty cool journey. I think you're in a, in a cool position. You've got a lot of awesome people around you. Um, let's let people know, I guess, where you come from and where you are now. You've done some cool things in that time. And then we're going to give people a, a nice little roadmap on why they may or may not want to become a superstar lawyer. That's very kind. And how to maybe grow a moustache that flicks up the, at the, the, end. the, the we, we will get to the moustache. And I'm happy to talk about the moustache at length. It's a question that most people ask. Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, so my family are originally Iranian. Um, we came to Australia when I was fairly young. And... Uh, you know, we weren't, we were skilled migrants, but we basically lived sort of the, the refugee story. You know, we, we left a country that at the time was not particularly stable. We still have family and whatnot there, but my family left to give me a better life. And it sort of informed the, the, the story that I followed. My parents are both doctors and they're both highly educated and really respected in the community. Um, so they, from a very early age, have told me, you know what, you've got to give back. You've got to give back. If you have intellect, if you have character, if you have spirit, it's your social responsibility to give back. And from a really early age, I have just absolutely hated bullies and I've hated people who took advantage of people. It's just something that has always rubbed me the wrong way. Um, I don't know if it has to do with the fact- You want to get rubbed. You don't want to get rubbed the wrong way. Well, that's right. If if I'm being rubbed, I want to consent to it, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm the one setting the ground rules for the rubbing. But it's, um, it's about like, it's about making sure that people know their rights and have their rights respected. And I used to, before I became a lawyer, um, I used to be a banker. So I was uh, in corporate financial services for a fair while. I did that um, first. And it really wasn't for me. Um, you know, I liked money. I liked moving money around. I liked talking to people about money. But um, it didn't give me the fulfillment that my current job does. And I really like being able to help people when they're down and help people when they're good. I mean, you don't just go to your lawyer when your life's falling apart. I mean, you do, but you should also go to them when things are going well. So like, for example, when you were thinking about, hey, should I, you know, should I go into business? Should I, should I set up corporations? Should I look at this? Should I look at that? We had that discussion. So it's, it's important to have chats and, and, and things at all different times. So it's kind of like being a trusted advisor. And I was actually thinking about this. Have you seen the film The Godfather? 
I have not. Oh my god. Well, immediately we should stop this. We should watch it and then come back. But if you do, there's this really cool character called Tom Hagen, who's the consigliere of the family. And a consigliere is like the third in charge of the mafia family. And he's a, he's a lawyer and he's got a unique practice where he kind of acts only for the godfather. And I remember, God, wouldn't it be great that the average person who wasn't a mafioso had a lawyer who was just so in someone's face and was wait, we, you know, ready to fight for them. And I thought, you know what, I, I don't admire the fact that he's a gangster lawyer, but I really admire the fact that he will fight tooth and nail to get things done in a respectful and powerful way. And I kind of thought that informed my story. Right. So you've seen The Godfather when you were, what, like 12 or something? I have seen it. I've, I, I have seen it when I was probably 15, and I would say I've seen it every year since. It is easily my favorite film. Um, and... The work of, uh, it's, it's a work of genius. Right. But that's kind of like the media that I took in at the time. Because at the time, when I was kind of growing up, the world was a very different place. Like the internet wasn't a really big thing until I was like 17, 18. And even then, I still remember being in my early 20s, needing, a, needing to like book a film. And the easiest way to do that was to call my friend and get my friend to walk to the place and, and book it. Like that's how much the world has changed in this short period of time. So you're, you, you've then, so you've gone from financial services, you, 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 you've thought, I'm going to become a lawyer. I'm yes. going to be like the godfather. <laughs> what was the word you used? Conciliere. Conciliere. Okay. From there, um, what I guess drove you to not only become a lawyer, but then start your own practice and then, you know, yeah, want to so go down the path of, I guess, building a, a brand and becoming yeah. a, a special talker on a stage <laughs> by the name of Ted. Um, look, it's, it's, I started out working in a practice for someone else and right from the get go, it really, that particular practice wasn't for me. Right. Um, it had, you know, not the best energy. The people were not what I would call very nice. We weren't super focused on our clients. Uh, we were focused more on doing the work. We were pretty abrasive to one another. And I really thought, you know what, maybe I've made a, a fool of myself getting into this law caper. And what I did then was I was in my like second year of law and I was like, oh man, I'm really in this now. Like I, I should have probably figured out I don't like law before doing two years of it and starting to work in a practice. So I went to court because, uh, you know, at that time, uh, my firm sort of sent me to court and they said, go do some observations. And I went and I saw this case um, and I saw these two barristers. I saw this outstanding prosecutor who's now a Supreme Court justice. Um, just make mincemeat of this totally unprepared defense lawyer who was just bumbling and inarticulate. And I was just like, I want to be as, you know, she really impressed me. She was an amazing, amazing advocate. And I was like, I want to be like her. I want to be the kind of guy that if someone asks me a question, I know the answer to it. And if that means that I have to put my head in the books, put up with nonsense like goes on at my firm, then that's what I'm going to do. So I, I, I knuckled down, I finished my time at law school. And then I went and became a practicing barrister for a while. So the guy with the wig and the gown. And I did that for, I think four or five years, like a fair while. Um, and I was just doing sort of trial work, appeal work and all this other stuff. So explain the difference between a lawyer and a barrister because That's, one, I myself had no fucking idea what it, this was. It's, so like, it's very confusing, but essentially you've got to think of it like this. Lawyer is a blanket word for anyone who practices law. All right. So... A solicitor, which is what I am, is somebody who does a lot of the stuff that's not in court. The writing of the contracts, the meeting with the clients, the taking of instructions, the preparing of documents. And a barrister is a specialist in courtroom advocacy. So they're the ones that go to court, they wear the wig, the gown, they make the arguments in high courts of record. Um, so I was, I was doing a lot of that advocacy stuff, but what I really missed was, um, and, and, and when you're a barrister, your clients are solicitors. And so when I was a barrister, I met all these different law firms with all these different energies, all these different styles, cultures. And I and I started to learn, oh my God, that law firm I worked in, that was just a toxic law firm. Like it was nothing to do with law firms in general. Just those people just weren't the right fit for me. Right. And so I was like, and, and it's a very lonely life as a barrister. Like it's hard because you are the, the tip of the spear. You're the one making the calls. You're the one that... So essentially a barrister is the person who sits at the top. So the solicitors, like you just said, gather the information, meet with the client, yep. being the person they're representing, 
getting everything in, in order and then they use all of that information and give that to the barrister. Right. They brief the barrister. the barrister. The barrister then goes and sits in court and defends. Doesn't. Yeah, right. and, and, and look, you, you sit with the barrister in court because it's their job to know the law back to front. It's your job to know the case back to front. Right. So, for example, they may not know every detail about you, but I should. I should know when you were born, what your dad's name is, what your mum's name is, what your story is, all of that stuff. Because in the middle of cross-examination, if the barrister turns to me and goes, hey, where did you go to school? I should be able to answer that. Right, okay. And, and, and it's sort of this separation. It's, 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 it's teamwork. It's almost like a GP and a specialist. Um, but as a barrister, I was learning a lot of law and I was being able to answer all those tough questions. But I missed the human side of it. You know, I missed being able to talk to the clients. And... When I met some law firms, and I met one in particular that's just, they've, I'm still very close with them. They had such really great culture. Like they mentored their young lawyers. They, they did work that was meaningful. And I was like, I want to build something like this. So I actually did something which is fairly unusual. I left the bar and came back to being a solicitor, which is quite, you know, most people don't do that. But it was just a better fit for me. And that's what made me want to set up executive legal. So it started off with a pretty basic purpose. It was, um, I wanted to represent young people who found themselves in trouble, primarily at festivals or with the police. Um, And that was it. I just wanted to make sure that I I helped young people because I was young once. And I think that it's really, it's it's scary to be young and in trouble. Um, And it kind of grew from that. And from that sort of genesis. Let's go back two seconds. Sure. Just to... Off target. That's your job. <laughs> young and in, young and in trouble. Do you believe that the young generation, whatever you class that as, yep. is taken advantage of by law enforcement or by different people because they have no idea what to do or no, they don't understand like what they can say yes and no to? Absolutely. I believe that there is a uh, there is a real ignorance of the law, which is used to enforce the law to the detriment of people. You know so. That's not anyone's fault, okay? And it's, this is not having a go at younger people, millennials, etc. The law is super complicated. It took me three years of law school, plus now practicing almost a decade to, to sort of even say, I kind of know some of the law. Like, I, not even I know all the regulations. But I think younger people in general are, are kind of taken advantage of in that they don't know their rights. They don't know how to enforce their rights. And if they try to enforce their rights, often people get in their face and stop them. So it's not just the police force. It's anyone. It's, it's the, it's, and that's my big thing is I'm the little guy lawyer. I act for the person with less power. I don't think it's fair that somebody who may be 18 or 19 has just finished school, has had very little life experience, is going to have to come up against the full force of the New South Wales Police Force with prosecutors, sergeants who've probably been practicing um, policing longer than they've been alive. So my job is to stand up for them and make sure that their rights are protected. It's never to to, to advocate for the wrong thing. It's never to um, stop people uh, from from doing, you know, if you do the wrong thing, you should be punished for it. There's, there's no denial of that. But it's also about you have rights. Let's Let's learn what they are. Let's enforce them when we should. Right. I like that. Yeah. And that's kind of the message that Executive Legal and my law firm's about. I mean, people always ask me, why did you name it Executive Legal? And I named it Executive Legal because the biggest software in the company at the world is Microsoft. Two words that both represent small and innocuous. And when I first started my law firm, I wanted a name that would scare you. That when I sent you a letter... You would go, oh my God, executive legal. That sounds like a big, scary law firm. And I, I remember we were broke. We had no money. So the first thing I did was I went and got the best printer I could. And I got the best paper so that when you got that paper in your hand and you read it, you were like, wow, this is a real like, tough law firm. Like if you came to our office, it was, this, it was this one windowless shack in the middle of nowhere. Like I would always go, let's meet for coffee. Let's, you know, don't come to our office. But it worked. It, t- it totally worked. It totally worked because people perceived us as being, you know, this really powerful, intense law firm, which we, you know, you become what you think about. It's this power of visualization. Manifestation, right? Absolutely. And that's sort of what happened. Right. And then from there, the business is building. You're getting people in the trouble, out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then this, uh, the speaking comes along, right? So yes. So speaking now. So, so look, how did I, that come about? That's um, I've always been interested in Ted. Ted has been one of like the, it's something that I watch regularly to keep myself inspired. Um, I think motivation and inspiration are a daily thing that you need to practice. It's not, 
it doesn't come to you naturally. It's something you have to work on. And even I am prone to mindsets which are less than perfect. And and, and As you would be, especially when you're going up in court with people that... Well, yeah, and, and it's, and it's, it's a easy. sad thing, right? Absolutely. It's easy to be disenchanted, you know, and, and you like your clients. I mean, every single client I've met, no matter what they've been accused of, and I don't just do criminal law, I do everything. I do, you know, a lot of advocacy, commercial law, um, refugee law. Every single client I've had has told me one thing that has totally broken my heart, that really showed me them in a human light. And even the most heinous people who've done the most awful things have, have, have gone through stuff that would really break your heart. And it's about kind of highlighting that reality about people because we, don't, we should never judge people by what they do on their best day or what they do on their worst day. We should judge them on an average Tuesday. Like on an average Tuesday, is this person an okay person? And kind of take that calculus. So I Ted- I'm gonna judge people now. Pardon? Oh, it's Tuesday, what are you like? That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. And absolutely, you know, um, you're not the best thing you've done in your life. You know, we don't, we don't often go, oh, this person did this one thing, they're great. I mean, we, sometimes we do, but you're not the worst thing either. You're a person. And exactly. People are, people are experiences and, and choices and amalgam of stuff. But the speaking thing. So um, I've always loved Ted. I've always tried to keep myself inspired. I watch a lot of their content and I, I really enjoy it. And a call went out for, um, from Ted saying, look, does, uh, Ted Sydney's looking for some speakers. Um, there's, they're going to do this call out to the general public. Um, if you've got an idea worth sharing, make a short video and tell us about it. And I, at first, I was like, "Yeah, I'm not going to do this. This is way too hard. This, like, what, what I did, what do I know about that nobody else does?" And I kind of wrote it off, and it just wouldn't go away. It was one of those like itches that just, and I was like, "Maybe I do know something." Can you turn the air conditioner on? Fuck, it's cold. <laughs> I got a jacket. I'm Mate, loving life. This flamingo shirt is crazy. <laughs> um, do you want to pause while you? No, no, no. Continue. Um, See, so yeah, it's raw. People love this shit. <laughs> and the speaking thing, anyway. Yeah, yeah so, so, it so, wouldn't so, go so, away. Ted. It wouldn't go away, and I just kind of had this itch, like uh, maybe I do know something worth sharing. And I kind of looked over what my life is about, and it's really about those raw human moments where you. It's about saying thank you and saying sorry. So. 99% of the human experience is really really neither here nor there. But when we say thank you and we mean it and we really, really mean it, I think it can change someone's life. And when we say sorry and we really mean it, it can change someone's life. And I'm pretty rigorous in the way that I do my cases. So I would always put a lot of time, energy and effort in helping my client and directing my client. Like, look, you need to say sorry properly. And never writing it for them, but sitting with them and being like, look, this is what an apology should feel like. And I went over some of the results I've gotten and things that would just amaze me. Like the person should have definitely gotten jail. The person should never have seen their kid again. The person like the and people capturing their apologies and giving that and really at that moment, that being a turning point for them. So that was what the talk was about. And I, I presented it. I got an opportunity to give a pitch. I went there. I pitched it. Um, it was it went really well um, and then Ted did a lot of work with me I got a curator and the team there was amazing we worked together and I kind of got to present it on the big stage at Ted in front of 6,000 people so the whole the whole talk was about how to how to write or how to get well, that's across right. the perfect apology and the and the formula is always why because and that's, that's right. it why because and I'm sorry I was late to Flamingo Sundays Jack because I know that you take a lot of pride in this podcast and the effort you put in. And in the future, I'm going to make sure that when I show up, it's, uh, it's going to be on time and it's going to respect the things that you value. Well, that's good. You know what I'd say? Well, unfortunately for you, Mr. Clanta, you were late once and that's all you get. <laughs> that's right. I'm done. <laughs> right. And, and what, what sort of impact did Ted, Ted have on... Look, it's, it's, it's done. I it's, guess your brand, your business, yourself, your mindset... Those sort of things are the pretty big deal, right? Absolutely. Look, it's it's done it's done a lot in a very I guess not in a direct way. I mean, yeah, there's been some speaking engagements that have come from it. There's been some, you know, new clients that have come from it. But more importantly, it's caused me to live a more authentic life around this particular thing. So, you know, I'm I'm here pushing authenticity to the world. And yet 
if you're not living authentically, how can you do that? You know what I mean? So what do I th- you mean by living authentically? Well, if I'm going to sit there and say, t- hey, you need to be able to say sorry correctly. And I do a mistake and I don't say sorry correctly. Well, am I really living the truth that I'm peddling? And so I've got my Instagram. I've got my, um, I've got my Facebook page. I've got like, you know, my blog and the various things that I talk about. And I really try to be honest with people and tell them, look, life's not always sunshine and rose. I mean... I struggle with mental health as much as anyone, you know. I sometimes have really bad anxiety. I get stressed out. I get worried. Um, and it's about being raw with people and telling them, look, it's the human experience has these these, these poles. Yes, I'm not going to lie. 90% of my time, my life is awesome. I can't complain. But there is a period in my life which is, you know, I'm, I'm, got, I'm, I'm facing challenges. I can face them. I can overcome them. And so can you. And so I'm a big ambassador on mental health. I spend a, you know, I'm, I'm a big ambassador for Movember, which talks about like men's mental health. Huzzah. Um, <laughs> and this, and, and the mustache. Well, let's just get to the mustache. You've, you've been eyeing it up since we've arrived. It's, uh, That's why everyone wants to talk to you. Yeah, let's I know. Let's be real. No one knows what you do when you wear a suit in the city. Everyone that looks the same. You look around the room and then boom, you spot this dude with a mustache that flicks upwards in both directions. And it looks like it never moves. <laughs> ever. <laughs> It doesn't. Let me tell you, the, the gel is made from, you know, it, the, the gel is made from dodos. Like, you can't get it anymore. They're, they're extinct. Um, I kind of grew it. I, firstly, I grew it when I was over in Italy. I saw a guy who had sort of one that was almost this good. And I was like, wow, I want that. <laughs> right. and, then I went through that, and then I went through that phase where it's just disgusting. And it's just awful and patchy. And then it kind of got to the stage where, okay, cool, I can groom it. You're real Persian that's, I'm telling you, man. They just is, come through. Absolutely, it's very ethnic. <laughs> um, but it's it's a, it's a, my invitation to the world to come and have a chat with me. It's my invitation to the world that um, I'm a bit quirky and a bit odd. I'm not crazy, but I'm a bit strange. And I, it's kind of my way of saying to the world that um, you aren't just your job. You aren't just your clothes. You are, you know, more than that. So. I've grown this because I want people to have a talk to me. I don't mind having a chat with people. I love hearing people's stories. Right. And it does. It opens that dialogue. Because if you're does. in a room, people are like, well, hey, if he's brave enough to grow that, he's probably not going to be a and jerk. it's a conversation starter, right? Absolutely. Like your flamingo shirt. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's purely a means to facilitate a conversation. And also, one of the things that I, I often wrestled with this before I was, you know, I was debating even cutting it. Like if somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I'm in a lot of trouble. Like I'm going to lose everything. And there's this guy standing there with his mustache looking at you. Like, is that not just, yeah. Is that not disrespectful to the person? And then I thought, you know what? No, it isn't. Because if, if they dislike it, they go, well, that guy looked like an idiot, but he seemed at least like nice. And if they like it, maybe it brings them a measure of peace. Um, and so, for example, I do a lot of mental health law and I go to hospitals and I act for people who are potentially mentally ill and are detained there against their, you know, against their will and they, they need to talk to someone. Now, they don't trust the system. They're unwell. They're scared. And then this guy rocks up with this mustache and this thing. So this at least shows them, look, I'm a human like you. I'm a bit silly. I'm a bit weird. We can chat. You don't need to, you, don't, you know, I'm a bit crazy too. <laughs> you know, I just haven't been caught yet. That's right. That's right. I just haven't been exactly right. The, 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 there's not sufficient evidence to put me away. Um, and that's sort of what it's about. It's about opening this message and being your authentic self. And it's brand too, right? Absolutely. Now, I didn't understand or appreciate the power of branding, but um, it is a really powerful tool. It's a really powerful tool to make sure your message gets out there. Um, your brand needs to be working all of the time, even when you're not. And so I've tried to build a brand of being compassionate, of being authentic and being competent. You know, um, it's not enough just to have a silly mustache. If I went to court and bungled all my cases, if I went to court and I wasn't articulate and wasn't well spoken, then I'd just be a guy with a weird mustache who's bad at law. <laughs> Shit, Lord. yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Shit mustache, and he can't yeah, exactly it. right, exactly right. Not only does he look funny, he sucks. <laughs> you know, and you don't need that. So it's. It, it's about building a brand and building an identity around who you are and what you're about. The mustache is a is an outward manifestation of I'm I'm pretty good at this stuff and I'm good enough that I can look ridiculous doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and this is why Flamingo Sundays was that's formed. Absolutely right, I'm man. Good at, I'm good enough at property to look silly while I'm doing it. But that's but people want results, and that's I think the reality is that um, form follows function, and people want results. 
you can look as ridiculous as you... I mean, I remember reading this article about this day trader probably in 2004 or five. Maybe it was in, I think it was in the Times or something. And he was the most successful day trader at the time. And he was this super young kid who would like... Everyone would be in these, you know, eight-piece suits at meetings. And he would just rock up in slacks. He'd call people man. He'd call people bro. He was super relaxed about it. But his he, he just got the market and he would always outperform the market. And everyone at the firm that he was at was like, you know, we've tried to change him. And he said, well, if you do that, I'll leave. Now that's power, that's authenticity. I feel that if he did wear those suits, he went to those meetings, he had to put his head down, he would have gotten less results for his clients. And I think that if you force people to be something they're not, and, and we as a society try to do this all the time. You know, we tell these awful messages to people. You've got to be, X to be happy. You've got to be Y to be happy. And the worst one that we tell is that this and this alone is the only opportunity you have to succeed slash be happy. And if you miss this opportunity, it's over for you. You know, particularly for, you know, university students, like if you fail this test, um, you're going to fail out of uni, you're going to be homeless, no one will ever love you, and you're going to die cold. (laughs) And that's the that's the message we send to these well, you know it's people. It's pretty intense. It I, is. I never experienced university, so I couldn't come. I can't come. Well, I mean, but you you've experienced what it's like to be told from authority, "Hey, this is the path you follow, and if you don't follow it, you're going to fail and you're going to be unhappy." And you have been very, very resilient and very assertive, and been like, "Well, no, um, I don't like path A, B, and C. Here's the flamingo path, <laughs> literally." And I'm gonna I'm gonna sideswept, and that's why I like admire and respect you because you're carving your own path, and I think that's what people need to know. Today you can, like today there's the job that I have, which is one part, you know, uh, speaker, one part lawyer, one part businessman, one part, you know, um, communicator and advocate and all of these things didn't exist 50 or 100 years ago. There's no such thing as someone who did all these different roles and different hats. And there are weeks where I like certain roles more than I like others. There's weeks where I'm like, I'm over being a lawyer. I don't want to ever go into court again. This sucks. I just want to speak all the time. And there are weeks I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered to speak. I just want to sit with a book. And that's the cool thing about 2020. The the, the categorization of a person has changed. Like, would you say you're just a buyer's agent? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely not. Okay. Would you say you're also probably a little bit of a media personality? Yeah. And a bit of a, you know, you're a bit of a speaker. You're a bit of a presenter. A bit of a lad. A lot you're a bit of a lad. Absolutely. You love a laugh. You love, but... The version of you that is the fundamental you excels at certain things. And it's by connecting with that authentic you, you get better at those things. You are a better buyer's agent because you embrace your inner lad. I think. For sure. And I think you're a better speaker because you embrace the inner you. Now, the reality is no one's, not everyone's going to like the personality that you bring to the table. So what? I'm not, I'm not there for everyone. I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone in the world likes coca-cola and it's the most popular drink in the world so like if if coca-cola with its billions of dollars of branding can't win over everyone what chance do i have with my dumb mustache exactly i like that Wait, that's, i think that's gold that was just really good you wanted a little rant there and just <laughs> stole yes. the show so i do that Thank sometimes you. it's annoying to my clients in court. i enjoy it your clients probably enjoy it too because when yeah. you're talking in court it's a good thing i would hope mate i think um that's your story through and through i believe it's uh, up until now you've still got a long way to go yeah um a lawyer, being a lawyer, there's a lot of misconceptions, like you said, Harry. What's his name? Harvey. Oh, Harvey ha- Specter. Harry Specter. Um, <laughs> As <up>. are. <laughs> uh, private jets, lots of money. It's going into court and doing all these cool things. Walk out and you go to the pub. And <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of misconceptions, right? Look, there are lawyers who do that. They exist. I don't know many, but they exist. Um, like Harry Specter. He's Harvey one. Specter is has a has a has a has a s. Um, they do exist. There are them out there, but they're few and far between and they're rare as hen's teeth. And it's not really like that. Right. Um, what do you want me to do? Cure some misconceptions? No, yeah, I think it'd be good. You know, if there's any aspiring lawyers that maybe you can give them a little bit of advice on how you would do it differently. Or sure. if you were coming back to do your time again, what you would do if you would change anything. Look, I think that the law has changed even in the short time that I've done it. And one of the beauties of the law is that it's always changing and that you can always contribute to that changing body of law. So if you go to court and you make an argument and that argument is accepted, then the law itself will change because precedence will be set. If you're going into the law for prestige, if you're going into the law for money, if you're going into the law 
because you, um, you know, you've, you've seen it on TV and you think it's cool, I really urge you to reassess it. There are jobs that carry far more prestige, make far more money, and have far less stress than this one. That being said, if you genuinely have a desire to change the world or change your client's kind of fate, this is a great job for that. And if you feel an, a kind of a civic responsibility to do that kind of stuff, you can't go past the wall. Um, we do heaps of pro bono work at Executive Legal because it's really important to me. Um, one of the coolest things that ever happened in my career is I acted for a young man whose father, just a really nice guy, and after we got it, uh, we, we won his case and we got it dismissed, we went out for a coffee and the father was talking to me and he goes, look, I'm actually in the, um, I'm in the garment business. Um, so, you know, I want to thank you. Let me get you a really nice suit. And I was like, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I've got plenty of clothes. I'm good. But a lot of my clients come, they don't have anything. Can you like help me out? Could you get me like one or two suits that maybe I can loan to them? And then after we do it, we can get them dry cleaned and stuff. He goes, absolutely. Let me take care of it. And this guy got me 10 suits. He got me 20 shirts. He got me all these belts and these shoes. And so the next lot of pro bono kids we had who couldn't afford that stuff, I could just give it to them. And the way they changed Jack when they walked in there, um, looking like a million bucks, having someone believe in them and, and, and giving them that so they could walk away and be like, you know what, I am worth something. Was the, it's the best thing that's ever happened in my career. Like it really is one of the coolest things that I've ever been able to do. And it's moments like that where you get to give back and really feel like, wow, I've done something great that make up for the many moments where you're like, well, this is just taking paper from pile A and moving it to pile B and then getting a letter that is bitchy from the other side and then putting it in pile C and then moving pile C to pile A. Um, sometimes you feel like a cog in the machine, but for some people you can make a real difference. And that is the reward of being a good lawyer. That's right. the prize. It's not money, it's not fame, it's not accolades. If you want that, do something else. There's plenty of easier ways to get that. That's probably one of the biggest misconceptions though, right? Everyone gets to the end of school and they go, okay, Mrs. or Mr., what do you want to do with life now? And they go, okay, accountants earn a lot of money, <laughs> lawyers, doctor. Like These are like the most common Absolutely. things, Absolutely. Right? You, you go to university. It's stable. It's stable and you earn a lot of money. Well, the law is not stable. We have tons and tons of graduates, um, many of who cannot find work. So don't go into it because it's stable. And because there's so many graduates, supply and demand, demand... <laughs> Supply is high, demand is high, supply drives down the price. So it's, don't go into it for money. Uh, one, one of the weirdest things is I, I really, when I started law, I wanted to be a, a like commercial only banking lawyer because I knew banking regulations back to front from my time in the bank. And I didn't get it. The only work I got was criminal law when I first started because I was a young ethnic lawyer and my clients were usually young ethnic men and women who didn't have a barrister who really looked like them or connected with them. That's the only reason they retained me um, was you, you, they looked at me and they thought, hey, he looks like someone who kind of knows what it's like to, to, to be in my shoes and to go through life in my way. And I got those cases and I won them and I lost some, but I, I, every case I took, I did my best. I absolutely gave it 100%. And from that, I sort of grew my practice and, and sort of got somewhere. Um, it has been a long road. It is nowhere near done. I mean, right now, the World Health Organization just declared a pandemic. Now, what that means in terms of what's going to happen to lawyers, I envisage that there's going to be a lot less work in certain areas because people are going to go, oh my God, we're not going to earn as much money. Let's not spend money on lawyers. Let's not do this. Let's not do that. There's probably going to be more work in certain areas like insurance law. Can we get out of this contract because there's now a pandemic? Is that a force majeure? But I can't trust or have faith in anything other than my ability to deal with the situation. And that's the thing that I've gotten better at over the years. There will always be uncertainty. If you ever go into something thinking it won't change, you're in for a nasty surprise. Sometimes you get a positive change. You know, like if you were going to be an ophthalmic surgeon and then the computers came out that did the surgery for you, yowza, all of a sudden, you know. Your, your, your yeah, earning capacity, job. well, no, your earning capacity goes up 10, 15% because the computer can do it for you and you still need to be there. Or if you go into somewhere where oh, we're going to do this very complicated procedure and some pharma company comes out with a pill that does it for you, well, you're out of a job. So it is about not, you can't trust the environment. You can only trust in yourself. You can only build up yourself and, and have faith in your abilities and your network to get you through that.
that was a bit ranty. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. Man. That was really good. I like that. So, one, one, I think, I think a really cool thing that since this is aimed at millennials, yes, what's probably one of the most common things that you deal with with young people and law. Uh, drugs it would at be, festivals. Something? Drugs at festivals is is a huge part of my practice. Okay. Yes. Well, let's let's help some people who have been caught with drugs at festivals or who plan to go to festivals in the future with drugs. Never take drugs to a festival. Let me begin with that. And to never, I mean, you don't know what's in them. Um, I've had clients who are sure that the drug is A. We get a drug analysis certificate from the police. It's not A. If they had taken it, they would have died. Um, the first thing I would like to say is this, and I, I really want to hammer this point home. And it's a story and it's, it's, it's not a happy story, but it's an important one. I remember very distinctly on a Saturday night, I got a call after a music festival. And it was a young man, really nice young man. He was terrified about, um, you know, he'd been caught with one pill. One pill is not a very big deal in the eyes of the law. I mean, it is and it isn't. And he was a really nice young man. And I remember talking to him and I, I spent a lot of time calming him down. And I was like, look, don't worry about it. If you want, I'll see you tomorrow because you seem really stressed out. Or you can come in first thing on Monday. Because yeah, Monday's fine. It's not going to be a big deal. And I said, don't worry about a thing. Look, are you okay? Do you need to talk to someone about this? You know, because he, he gave me a really sus vibe and I was a bit worried about him. So anyway, the next day, I still didn't get a good vibe on it. And I contacted him again. He's like, yeah, no, I'm fine. I'll come see you on Monday. And that Sunday, he took his own life. Um, and I just remember thinking, oh my God, this is a, like, a young university student who has his whole life ahead of him. And because he was so scared his future would be taken from him, he just, he, he went, he went too far and not, there is nothing so bad that we can't talk about it. There is no problem we can't work together to solve. And so that's the first and most important thing that I really want to hammer home to your audience. No matter how bad the situation looks, it is usually not as bad as you think it is. If it is as bad as you think it is, it is my job to help you with it and always do that. That's the first. The second thing is this, you have rights and you're allowed to exercise them when dealing with the police or when dealing with any particular authority. Executive Legal does a lot of work around building awareness of those rights. So check out our Facebook page. If you want, send us a message on the messenger. Um, usually one of our lawyers will read it. If they don't, we'll get back to you and just give us a call. Like I, I, I'm happy to take a call. I will always take a call to help somebody if I can. And if I can't, I'll tell you, hey, look, this is not my expertise. I'll refer you to the right person. But the the... The challenge of being a young person is that you believe that one mistake will define you and often it won't. It doesn't need to. Do you know what I mean? Right. So you can, you find yourself in this situation that seems hopeless. Like, oh my God, I did this dumb thing and now, you know, it's against me. Or even let's take away the criminal law aspect. Let's say, you know, you buy an apartment and you want to get out of that contract and you can't and you feel trapped. Well, that's what lawyers are for. You know, that's, that's what we're here to do. We're here to give you an objective opinion of the law. And there are lawyers much better at the law than I am. There are lawyers much, you know, more personable than I am. So I've put together a team that I think has a good mix um, and, and tries to, to, to do that process because you, sh you never need to go through life alone. Life's hard enough. Being a human is super hard. <laughs> like, you know, you don't eat and after a short time you die. If you don't breathe, you're dead in five minutes. Like it's it's crazy how hard it is to be a human being. And we put all this pressure on ourselves on top of the pressure of biology and sociology and culture. So that would be my advice. Don't take things too seriously. It's a, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Right. Okay. Mate, I reckon that's gold. I think there's been a lot of gold in this. In oh, mate, this. it's a uh, biggest nugget to go. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my finest work, I think. Mate, I, uh, I thank you very much for, for coming in and joining us. I uh, always ask my uh, guests at the last question. It's yes. very ego-driven, as you can tell. Yes. Full of ego. Ego's a good thing <laughs> if channeled kidding. correctly. I'm no, no, no. I, uh, I, I, I get them to ask me a question. So what's a question you'd like to ask me, Jahan, that you believe would bring value to the audience? I have a good one, actually, Jack. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. All right. Um, Jack. Yes. You portray a very positive and energized mindset. What do you do when you don't feel as positive and energized as you usually are to recharge yourself and to give good energy back into the universe? That's a good, that is a good question, to be honest. And that generally, like 99% of the time, I'm always happy and positive. And the, the times that I'm not, it's generally after, like, you know, 
enjoying big weekends or cereal. <laughs> it's true. Like that yeah. has a massive effect on your mindset and the way you think. And that takes days and days and days. Even though you feel right some days, you're like, when you actually feel right, you're like, fuck, I was not right that day. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is just like, like, I guess tangible stuff is just like sleep and rest and like you, it's it's very hard for me to say this is what I do because I'm always like that. I wake up happy and positive all the yeah. time. And when I don't, I know the reason I haven't is because that I've done something to affect that, which sure. is generally not having enough sleep and not eating the right food or going out on the weekends or all that type of stuff. So my thing is just like rest, eat good food, and then obviously thinking positive things, right? But then I guess layered on top of that is like you have to realize how good you really have it regardless if you're the worst person in Australia. Like the worst life in Australia, which you would think, fuck, that's a pretty bad life, is you're probably still in the top 10% of the world, right? It's yeah. easy for someone to sit here who's got a great life and say that. But like that, that's what you have to think. It's perspective at the end of the day. Everything is perspective. So on your worst day, like your worst, worst, worst day you can ever think of, that's probably 80% of the world's best day. It's true. true. Yeah, true. you're right. Like, it's hard for us to perceive that because we live in Australia and everything's so easy. You said life so hard, being a human. Yeah, it is. But to an, like an extent, we have everything so easy. You know, um, and I guess that's the biggest thing. But my like the only reason I'm affected is is by like biology. actually affected. Yeah, is by biology. When I'm having a bad day, like in terms of like nothing's going right, I'm still like, fuck, who cares? You know, like it doesn't really affect me too much. That's awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for coming in, my friend. Now let's go and get some breakfast and drink some coffee. Cool. Off. Now give us one more. Now you, you, you didn't give her on your signature. Uh... Ah, boom, <laughs> boom. Thanks. <bro. laughs>